Af- <coughs> Hello. Am I better here, dear? The other one. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Henry, for the introduction. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. You know, there's a story. Remember in 2015, Pope Francis came to the Philippines. When he came over, the different groups, church groups, lay groups, they were all vying to be able to see him, to receive his blessings, and just to see him in person. Now, one of these groups was the pro-life groups, the family groups, and they had their chance at MOA. So in that place in MOA, Everybody was there. Everyone was in a frenzy. They were trying to jockey for better positions to see the Pope. Out in a corner was an old couple seated very quietly. They didn't know that beside them was a young lady reporter, journalist. And this old couple, the man was calling his wife, oh, darling, sweetheart dearest, and so on. Now, the lady journalist beside became so curious. Wow. All such switch word, words. So she couldn't help herself. She said, sir, may I just ask you please, out of curiosity, how old are you? And then the man said, I'm 90 years old. And your wife? Oh, she's 88. Wow. Why may I ask, uh, why are you asking? I'm just curious, sir. What is your secret? Said, what secret? At your age, you're calling her darling, sweetheart, dearest, and so on. What's your secret? And the man whispered into her ear. I forgot her name. <laughs> and I'm darn scared as hell to ask her. So that's a story of what sweetness can hide. And there was also a story of course, about a very unique judge. There was a celebrated case going on. It was a case of murder. So after the long case and all the arguments were presented by both the prosecution and the defense, at the end, during the summation, the final word, so to speak, the prosecution rose and said, Your Honor, in the light of all the evidence and all the w- witnesses and the testimonies presented and the arguments presented by the prosecution, we ask that the court declare the accused guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. Then the judge looked at the prosecutor and said, You're right. Then The defense stood up and said, Your Honor, in the light of all the counter evidence and all the testimonies presented by our witnesses and our counter arguments, we have shown that the prosecution has not established beyond any reasonable doubt the guilt of the accused. We hereby ask, therefore, that the court declare him not guilty. And the judge said, you're right. Then when he heard that, the court uh, stenographer stood up. But your honor, they both can be right. The judge said, my son, you are also right. (laughs) Well, this was a case of the principle of non-contradiction being violated. In the time of a very great Greek philosopher who was a personal tutor of Alexander the Great. His name was Aristotle, and he was father of so many sciences, father of science, father of logic, father of botany, zoology, name it, practically all the sciences. He was the father. Don't ask who the mother was. Anyway, uh, Aristotle used to say, The first law of thought is the principle of non 
contradiction. Now, what does that mean? It means that a statement cannot both be true and false at the same time in the same sense. If it is true, it is true. If it is false, it is false. But it cannot be true and false at the same time in the same sense. That's the first law of thought. Now, to him, he took this very seriously to the point that he said, if anybody violates the principle of contradiction, if any people believe in violating the principle of contradiction, then it's time to close all universities. Because if ignorance is the same as learning, then there is no sense in exerting effort to learn. And not only that, he said, it's time to end all discourse. No need to discuss. Because if what you say is something, and I say something contradicting it, and we're both right, no sense in discussing. Might as well just go to a corner, sit down quietly, say nothing, because if thinking is the same as not thinking, just be there and be a plant and vegetate. So that was Aristotle speaking. Now, I'd like, go, like to go fast forward to something which I think you often hear. Because nowadays, we are really deluged with so many statements that appear in the newspapers, magazines, talk shows, in many forms of media presentation. You come across people like Stephen Hawking, that scientist, you know? Now, these people, many of the scientists right now get so engrossed in their field of specialization, especially the physicists, to the point that Hawking said, the only knowledge that is valid is knowledge that is verifiable through measurement. If it is measurable, it is valid. If it is not measurable, it is not valid. So if you talk about God, since you can't measure God, it's not valid. God does not exist. That's his statement. Okay? Now, well, that's an interesting statement, don't you think? Maybe we can ask Hawkins. Is the beginning of time measurable? Of course it's not. Therefore, if it's not measurable, it does not exist. Okay? Now, so in other words, do you have any thoughts in your mind? Yes. Are they measurable? No. Therefore, those thoughts do not exist. See? Where lies the mistake of Hawkins? His mistake is the very same mistake of people who get so infused and so possessed by the knowledge that they think, because they have this particular kind of knowledge, no other kind of knowledge is valid. That's the mistake. In geometry, for instance, no? this is mathematics, no? very, very simple and crude kind of mathematics. What do you talk about? You talk about lines. You talk about triangles. You talk about squares. You talk about circles. You talk about geometrical figures, right? So in geometry, you only deal with geometrical figures. And the geometrician can keep pontificating and telling you all sorts of thing, things because he's an expert in that. Now, if you talk to the geometrician and you say, how about the color yellow, blue, and red? The geometrician will say, what? Yellow, blue, and red, that's not found in geometry. Will it be right for him to say, because it's not in geometry, color red, blue, and yellow do not exist? He cannot say that. Of course he can say it, but he'd be wrong. Right? Why? Because the geometrician, his domain is only geometrical figures. 
outside of that, he cannot say anything outside of that. He cannot affirm the existence. He cannot deny the existence. He cannot try to prove or disprove it because that's beyond the scope. That's beyond the scope of geometry. Okay? So we must remember that. When these people talk about their lines being the only valid kind of knowledge, that's what you call intellectual hubris. You know? Uh, somehow you develop that kind of pride that your field of specialization is the measure by which all other fields should be measured. Come on. Example. Physics. In physics, physics is the study of energy and matter and the interplay of these two existence, matter and energy, their interplay with each other. But because physics has reached a very advanced state, it has been able to give man the power to control some forces of nature, okay? The atom, physics has given man the power to control some forces of nature, but physics as physics, while giving the power to control some forces of nature, physics as physics will not tell you whether that power of the atom is to be used for curing ailments or for creating weapons of mass destruction. Because good and evil, right or wrong, do not belong to physics, as physics. They belong to some other field. They belong to the science of morality. We call moral philosophy. In philosophy, in it, Excuse me. In addition to that, we have, of course, faith. The revealed truths of God as given to man. See? So, why am I emphasizing this? I am emphasizing this because there is so much deception now going on. The enemies of God, the enemies of religion, are resorting to all sorts of means to be able to deceive. There are half-truths, there are uh, outright lies, half-truths, hidden truths. Truth has been hijacked already. See? You want, you want an example? Simple. You get a newspaper. You get a newspaper. Say, Philippine Star. Philippine, what's the other one? Uh, Inquirer. Manila Times and so on. The same event, you will see it reported in different ways. Why? Because they're not reporting any more straight news. What they're reporting is news colored with their opinions. You see? You want straight reporting? You go to Business World or Business Mirror. They give you straight factual reporting. Given the same event, you will see them report it factually. You see the other three broadsheets, they say it as if they are columnists writing. See? So that is how to hijack truth. And never mind, there is another part uh, wherein I might be able to go later on if I have time, no? But suffice it to say that when you encounter scientists or reports in newspapers or magazines or talk shows or TV programs that say, it has been discovered that this so-and-so Science says there is no God. Forget it. There is no way. There is no way any scientist worth his salt can prove or disprove the existence of God in his own science. Because the existence of God is proven in some other branch of knowledge. It's a philosophical branch called metaphysics the science of things as they exist, the nature of things. That's another, that's another field, no? But suffice it to say, any scientist who insists on his line and says, 
Anything outside of his field is not valid. Is either suffering from hubris, excessive pride, or if they insist after you have explained so clearly, baka may konting sayad na. Okay, now. On that thing I was mentioning earlier about the principle of contradiction, uh, I'd like to take up with you something you might have already taken up, but I will do this only for purposes of illustrating how the principle of contradiction is very much depended upon by the Catholic Church because it is your only guide to sanity and correct thinking. Mr. White. This is a life experience I had. One time I received a call from my uncles uh, years ago because my, the wife of my uncle suffered a stroke and she was there lying in one of the beds at the Manila Sanitarium because these uncles of mine were Seventh-day Adventists. They converted to the Seventh-day Adventists about late 50s. And so I was there, I went there precisely to console them, so on. Well, to my surprise, after the pleasantries and so on, they took the opportunity to talk to me about their religion. And the whole thing, they were taking turns because they were brothers. Both of them were already pastors in the Seventh-day Adventist group. And they were taking turns trying to convince me and so on and so forth. Honestly, I was feeling sleepy and bored and I wanted to leave. But every time I would make excuses, I'd say, hey, don't you think it's getting late? No, no, Tony, let's talk about this and so on. So finally, before I knew it, it was nearly 5 o'clock. And the birds of the air were out. Birds of the air were active. And I was already about to sleep. And I said, Uncle, okay, I think we've talked a lot already. Maybe we can go. He said, no, Tony, please. We'd like to hear from you. What is your reaction to the thing we have said? So I said, you know, honestly, since you people became Adventists, I was still a small boy at that time. I heard about that, but when I became a teenager and I became an adult and we would meet in parties, I wouldn't bother mention this, mentioning this thing to you because I respect you so highly. Why won't you just keep it at that? Then he said, no, please. We'd be very pleased if you could give us your reaction. So I said, all right, uncle, you know, what you've been telling me so far, what you've said in about five hours, more than five hours, is reducible to only one statement. That statement is the sole guide to salvation is the Bible. Now, is that right? He said, yes. It is only the Bible. So I said, will you now tell me, please, how come you believe in the Bible so much? Because it is the written word of God. So I said, well, of course, when you say the written word of God, you don't mean that God wrote it in heaven and dropped it on mankind. No. He inspired the works, the, the written word, the Bible. I said, okay, fine. Now, can I ask you a straight question? Then he said, okay, what is it? How do you know that the Bible is a written word of God? Did Jesus Christ appear to you? And did he say, have no fear, my son, because it was I who sent my Holy Spirit to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to Peter and Paul, and told them, go ahead, write the Bible. Write the New Testament Bible. We were talking about the New Testament Bible. 
Did Jesus Christ tell you that? No. Did Jesus Christ appear to your father who first influenced you to become a Seventh-day Adventist? Did Jesus Christ appear to him and say the same thing? Look, don't be afraid. I was the one who sent my Holy Spirit to talk to the four evangelists to write down the New Testament. Did Jesus Christ appear to your father? No. Did Jesus Christ appear in person to Ellen G. White, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventists? And did she talk to Jesus Christ after receiving the same assurance? No. So therefore, he said, if God did not appear to you, and if God did not appear to all the Seventh-day Adventists around the world, if God did not appear to all the, even the Catholic Christians around the world, one billion at the time, plus another 800,000, close to two billion Christians who believe in the Bible. How do you know now that the Bible is really the written, the inspired word of God? Who told you this? Don't you think you should ask that question before you say the Bible is the only guide to faith? I said, okay, Tony, let's see you. What do you have to say? I said, look, let's start with a few things. Which put, let's put things in the historical setting. I said, if you admit that God himself does not guarantee that the Bible's uh, New Testament Bible is his written word, is his inspired word, then somebody else other than God must be the guarantor. That somebody else less than God must have said, look, do not worry. It's really God who inspired the writing of the New Testament. Now, if it is someone less than God, like a human being, that human being or that group of human beings should be credible, right? What are the qualifications of the guarantor who says that New Testament Bible is inspired by God? What are the credentials to be credible, trustworthy, okay? Now let's put this in the proper setting now historical setting. After St. Peter, the first pope, was killed by Nero, and the other popes who succeeded him, after about 31 popes or so, were all martyred by the Roman emperors. Why? Because the Christian faith was belief, was one that extolled Belief in God, in Jesus Christ, who was a rival now to the emperor of Rome because at that time, the emperors of Rome declared they were gods. So they were rival gods, okay? So naturally, they had them killed. <clears throat> Not only the popes, but the early Christians who were fed to lions, who were burned at stake, all the religious items and articles were being looted and thrown into the fire. Among these, of course, were some of the books they were carrying with them. Some of the inspirational religious books. It came to the point now that because of the massive persecution, some of the Christians were saying, look, I have these books with me here. They may come and get these books from me. But if these are inspired works of God, I will not give them up. The problem is, what if I keep keeping this, taking care of it, defending it from destruction, because I'd rather give my life rather than inspired work of God. But what if it turns out that this book is not inspired after all by God? Supposing somebody else just wrote it who felt being devout and religious. What will that become of me? A martyr by mistake? 
You see? So, what did they do? These Christians who are troubled by these problems approach now the Catholic bishops and the priests. And they said, look, can you please tell us which of all these books that are spread all throughout this place are really inspired by God and which are not? And so, the great saint, the only son of Saint Monica, Bishop Augustine, called the Council of Hippo in 393 AD. That council studied, took a look, reviewed all the books going around, and it decided, it started examining each book carefully. And then they came out with the final decision that there are only 27 books of all the collections of books available. There were only 27 books which were declared divinely inspired. Okay? Now, but that is not the end of the story. The more important part of the story is how did the church determine that these were really divinely inspired. So, what did the church do? Now, let's go back, way back, into the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ gathered 12 apostles. He taught them all there is to know about the faith that will gain us salvation, gain salvation for us. And all the truths that were necessary, he gave to the apostles. Now at that point, I asked my uncle, I said, what are the only three words personally written by our Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament? Just three words, because they claim to be Bible experts. Then they couldn't answer. And they said, why, Tony? What were those three words? I said, uncle, do not be mad with me. Huh? I said, why? Because when I asked that question, you should have immediately dismissed the question as a wrong question. Why? Because in the time of Jesus Christ, the New Testament was not written yet. There was not a single page, not a single word, or a single period or comma, of the New Testament. The first book of the New Testament came around about 20 years after our Lord's ascension to heaven. And the first book was not a synoptic gospel. It was just a letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Okay? So, now, in short, our Lord Jesus Christ taught his apostles through the spoken word. When he did this, teaching the apostles through the spoken word, he was beginning divine oral tradition. All right? Divine oral tradition. Not a purely human tradition, but a divinely ordained oral tradition. That, how do you know? Because that was the way our Lord Jesus Christ spoke, uh, taught the faith. That's why when he told his apostles, preach to all nations, he did not say, write the Bible and have it read. Preach to all nations in the same way that I have preached to you. And this was done, of course, also by the apostles. So the first 5,000 apostles, I mean, uh, converts of the faith, early converts of the faith, as mentioned by St. Peter, were all beneficiaries of the same oral tradition received from Christ. And that was so for succeeding centuries. It was all oral tradition. Now you might say, but how could that be done? Of course it can be done. Because if you believe God can make something from nothing, he can cer certainly preserve the integrity of his teachings through oral tradition. By entrusting these teachings to people he's guiding. People is blessing with his guidance. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, it took 
up to the year 1450 when the Gutenberg press was invented. And it was only then that they started having all these different, different books assembled and written into a single book. Before that, the books of the New Testament, excuse me, they were not together. They were written separately. They were only written in scrolls. Some of them were in Antioch. Some of them were in Thessalonica. Some of them in other places. They were not put together at the time because there was no printing press yet at the time. Okay? So look, what is the conclusion there? It is not true that the only guide to faith is the Bible because everybody at the time, up to the time before the printing press was invented, received Christ's instruction through oral tradition, including the apostles. Will you now say that apostles are also lost because there was no Bible yet? Of course not. Okay? Now, we go now to the question we asked earlier. How did the church determine which of the uh, books were divinely inspired and which were not? They identified only 27 and pronounced them certified divinely inspired. Which are the same books now used by the Protestants? They also have the same 27 books. Of course, with some adjustments, you know. They altered some, some things there. But the point is, okay, how did the church determine that? Simple. See, the church taught then, as it still teaches now, that God is truth, and truth is one. So what God reveals in oral tradition, he will not contradict in his written tradition. Okay? So, all the books then, when the church gathered these books, when the, when the church gathered them all and said, okay, those that conform to the deposit of the faith we have received to divine oral tradition, divinely inspired. Those that do not conform or violate it, not from God. All right? Because there is one thread, the thread of truth. Truth is one, and truth cannot contradict truth. It can only complement each other. Okay? So that was it. Now, there you see that the church made use of the principle of contradiction also. Okay? Now, in doing that, what did the church really exemplify? What things did you learn from this? First, that the teaching authority of the church has to be upheld respected and propagated as much as we can. Because without the teaching authority of the church, nobody would certify that those works were really divinely inspired. To accept them, therefore, as divinely inspired is to accept the teaching authority of the church. If the religious, the, the non-Catholic denomination say, the church is this, the church is bad, it's been lying and so on. Why do you believe in the Bible? You have only the word of the church that is divinely inspired. If you deny the authority of the church, you might as well deny Bible. Right? Now, another thing. They say, forget this tradition. All of that, that's humanly made. Excuse me. Not the divine oral tradition started by Christ. That wasn't human. That was divine in origin. Now, if you want to deny also that tradition, then forget your Bible. Because the Bible was declared officially inspired by God only if it conformed to oral tradition. If it did not, out. Some of the books there that they, they, they cataloged and were trying to compare and determine included the Gospel of St. Peter, the Gospel of the Twelve Apostles. In fact, 
even the book of Revelation, Apocalypse, nearly did not make it to the 27. But it did. Okay? So, that's the thing you must remember. The Bible was written by the Catholic Church. The Bible survived because it was kept in the vaults of the monasteries. And it's only the Catholic Church that announced to the world that the Bible exists. It is only the Catholic Church that certified it is the inspired word of God. So I told my uncles, do you still think the church is as bad as you say? They kept quiet. So that was the story. The importance of the principle of non-contradiction. Truth cannot contradict truth. Okay? So, I, I, I think, is that clear enough for you? Okay. Excuse me. I'll be, you'll have to be patient with me because from there, I'll be moving on now to some aspects of philosophy. You know? Well, when the ancient Greeks were talking about philosophy, that word philosophy comes from two Greek words. Philos, which means love. Love of wisdom. Sophia means wisdom. Why do they call it the love of wisdom? It is because wisdom, as used by the Greeks, meant knowing things through their first causes. Knowing things through their first principles. So they believe that if you knew a thing, through its first principles, through its first causes, then you have known that thing wisely. Okay? Now, there are three specific branches of philosophy that can be of help in explaining our, our faith. There is the branch of philosophy known as metaphysics, wherein you prove the existence of God. There is the branch of philosophical psychology, wherein you prove the nature of man and the existence of the human soul. And there is, of course, Another field called moral philosophy, but we won't go into that. The other one is, of course, logic. Logic. You must have heard of logic. You, you took this up in your college days. Uh, you'll just be patient with me because I'll be going now. You see, as Henry pointed out here earlier, and we're calling now what St. Thomas Aquinas used to say in his time. He said, when you're talking to heretics, you can use the New Testament to prove certain things he's saying are false and that the things you believe in, the Catholic faith, are true. 
you can use the New Testament. But when you're talking to the Muslims or the Jews, you won't use the New Testament. You will have to use the Old Testament because that is what they accept. However, when you're talking to one who does not accept the Bible because he doesn't believe in God, no way, no way to talk about the Bible to one who does not accept God's existence. The only way to do it is to appeal to natural reason and hope that with your proof, you might be able to convince him that there is God. However, let me add as a word of caution. Nowadays, when you talk about the atheist, the atheist nowadays is not really who proves to you there is no God. Even the great scientist Richard Feynman, that great mathematician who was responsible for making the Manhattan Project materialize, the atomic bomb. At the time, the assignment was given to the scientists to be able to finish, complete the first atomic bomb because they were going to use it on Hiroshima. But at the time, the technology required to be able to do that needed a very complex kind of mathematical computation. And nobody could come up with that. They did not have the way to do it. So this guy, Richard Feynman, who was a genius in these things, solved the problem. He came up with a very practical, workable, mathematical method to be able to enhance or facilitate the production of the atom bomb. He is noted for that. In fact, he is one of those who explains sciences as if he was just talking about touring, going on a tour. You'll be entertained by the way he explains things. But this man, unfortunately, never received the grace of the faith. So he did not believe in God, but he was at least intellectually honest to admit that nobody can prove God does not exist. In other words, that's good. That's, good. that's being honest, right? No. Okay. But when we talk now about the atheist, or the person who does not believe in God. We draw a line. We draw a line somewhere. Because does he mean that there is no way to prove the existence of God? Or does he mean I can't accept God exists because you know, there are two kinds of people. Those people who are afraid of losing God and those who are afraid of finding God. Right? Is he the type is who is afraid of finding God? That's why he says, there is no God. Because I might see him. Kagaya lang yan ng tao. Naniniwala ka ba sa multo? Hindi. Ayoko nang makakita. Okay? So, uh, If the person who denies there is God is denying God for his own personal reasons, he doesn't want to obey God's laws, he doesn't want to, he feels straight jacketed if you tell him do this, do that, God wants this. If he is the type who wants to be liberated from any of God's prescriptions, then he is not really saying there is no God. What he is saying is, yes, I don't want to get out of my comfort zone if I start believing in God. That's what he means. So when you're really talking to an atheist, you'll have to find out, is he really denying the existence of God on philosophical grounds? I'll assure you, he cannot do that. 
because there is no philosophical way to deny the existence of God. So chances are he is just denying God for practical reasons because he'll feel uncomfortable if there is God. Okay? So that's the first thing. The same thing too, of course, in apologetics in almost any situation. Pakiramdaman ng muna. The model is St. John Paul the Great. In catechizing, he says, you have to be very careful. If there is somebody you want to convert, try to find out first a little, the, the minimum you can about him. Because if he happens, let's say, to, uh, in other words, work on the thing that you and he have in common. Don't come in from Mars. Don't come in from another planet and say, it's this, it's that. Even if it's the truth, look first for something you have in common. That way, you can start on common ground. Otherwise, you'll be talking about white when this is black. Try to look if there are areas of gray that you can talk about and begin there. That's prudence. Besides, when we convert, and try to talk about apologetics, we'll have to do that with charity, with as much diplomacy as possible. Why? Because it's not only what you say, but how you say it. See? What you say will only enter here, the mind. But the way you say it will hit the heart. And it is prudence that tugs at the heart. The truth that you will be saying, fine, that's important, but that's in the mind. But if you say it in a nasty way, in an aloof way, or in a drastic way, in an aggressive way, as the song goes, inside one ear and out the other. So you have to be very cautious. You're dealing with human beings. You're dealing with a human heart. So the first thing is, Learn to know how to touch the human heart. If you read carefully the homilies of St. John Paul, you will see that they hit, they enter the mind, and they end up in the heart. That's the model. So let's study his homilies and try to see how we can adapt it to our own style. Okay? Now, let's go now to the proof of God's existence from purely philosophical grounds, okay? Now, as I said, I doubt very much if you'll be using it a lot in your encounters because out of 100 people who deny the existence of God, maybe 99 to 99.99, .99, if there is such a thing, will be denying God purely on emotional or Moral grounds, if you want to put it that way. Moral grounds that he cannot accept. All right. Anyway, you'll just be patient because this philosophical explanation may not sound very exciting. But please just listen to the points because at least you can say that we have very strong, solid grounds for believing in God. Okay? Now, Let us say that something begins to exist right now. For the first time, this thing begins to exist. Question, what brought it into existence? Only three possibilities. Either it was brought into existence by something other than itself, or 
it was brought into existence by nothing or it was brought into existence by itself. No other possibilities. Either by something other than itself, by nothing, it came from nothing, or it brought itself into existence. Now, carefully, could it have been nothing? Could nothing have, could nothing have produced Something. Of course not. Because nothing is precisely the absence of anything. If nothing, please have a seat. If nothing is the absence of anything, how can it produce something? So there is no way that nothing produced this thing that now exists. The next possibility itself. Could this thing that now exists, newly exists, could it have brought itself into existence? Impossible. Why? Because before it existed, it did not exist. And if it did not exist, how could it have brought itself into existence? Therefore, the only thing left is that this thing was brought into existence only by something other than itself, all right? That other thing that brought it into existence is the cause of its existence. And the thing that exists now is called the effect. So the cause is related to the effect, all right? Excuse me, let me drink. While Tony is taking time to drink, see Mr. Shornak uh, arrange an amici merienda for us. May take home din ba? Okay. I, I, I must warn you that you are lucky people because in four years of schooling, you will get everything in two hours. <laughs> so this is not really fair for the speaker to encapsulate four years. Huh? But this must be the start of something profound in our thinking, okay? So, yan naman ang course natin eh. We plant the seed, we expand our study. Now, all right, so we already know the cause is the reason why the effect exists. It, the cause brings about the existence of the effect. Now that is the case we find in things of this world or this universe. Cause and effect relationship. I was caused by my, my existence was caused by my parents Theirs was caused by their parents and their parents and so on up the line, okay? Now, why is it that you have also cats and dogs and animals? The same story. They have their parental stock and so on up the line. Why is it that you have plants? They grow. You've got seeds, cross-pollination, the same thing. But in addition, of course, it becomes more clear that you need sunlight, you need water, you need carbon dioxide to make these things live, just as we all need them, all right? Now, so all the things of this world, all the things of this universe are related somehow to each other from cause to effect. Now, here.
I was never good in drawing. So you just have to be patient. Yes. Sure. Okay, Sige, go ahead. Are you done? Uh, this is also our first time, no? Uh, our student generously made the blow up. Binood niya tayo, Saldi. Thank you, ha? Hindi lang sandwich, kundi amici, pasta, and the whole works. Thank you. Madaming bagsak. <laughs> okay, but but uh, we cannot do get our food all at the same time because we are have limited time here. So maybe we'll ask the senior <laughs> like me to go first. Para hindi tayo sabay sabay, and then the the kids and parang airlines pala, no? senior kids, uh, ladies. Yung mga lalaking malulusog, huli na. So, so, pwede na umpisahan ngayon, mga senior, no? You just get your, and then ladies. Uh, madaming naman dyan, hindi, everybody will be fed up. Uh, fed up. <laughs> okay, we can start now so that we don't eat up the time na hinto lahat tayo. Kasi bago matapos yan, isang oras eh. Eh, meron pa tayong... Six hours to go. <laughs> now, imagine that these are cars of the train. Hinihila ng train. The locomotive is somewhere up there. Okay? Now, notice this thing is being pulled by this. This by that. That by this. That by that. In other words, this will not move unless it is pulled by this one. Neither will this move unless it's pulled by this, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Now, question. Is it possible that this whole thing stretches into infinity where there is no first locomotive, no source of power that will pull this. Is it possible that it will stretch to infinity and still move? Now, the standard argument we have, of course, is if it is really infinite, then there is no beginning. If there is no beginning, how can there be a motion? Okay? So there has to be a beginning somewhere. So if you compare this now to the things of this world related by cause and effect and so on, it cannot be that there is no first cause of the existence of all things of this world. There has to be a first cause that is in itself uncaused. The prime cause of everything and that we call God. Okay? All right. In short, no? There are of course many ramifications here, but never mind the technicalities. So that is one approach. Now, but what if the one you're talking with ay masyadong pilosopo? Sasabihin niya, eh paano ngayon kung talagang infinite nga yun? No? In other words, he will just insist for the sake of argument only. No? That it really stretches into infinity. There is no first cause. In other words, what if our universe always existed through eternity without anyone creating the universe. It was just there. You understand? So that is now 
the position of this bullheaded, stubborn guy you're talking to. All right. Well, here are things you have to distinguish. There are, remember the example a while ago about something first begins to exist? Now, in the case of something that did not exist before, but began existing at a certain period, that thing, before it existed, it was possible for it to exist. Just like us. We are here now. 1,000 years ago, no one of us here existed. And yet, 1,000 years ago, was it possible for us to exist now? Of course, you say yes. The question is, can we prove that 1,000 years ago, at some future time, it would be possible for us to exist? Of course, it can be proven. Why? Because if it was never possible for us to exist 1,000 years ago, we'd never exist now. So the fact that we exist means it was possible for us to exist, right? Oh, so what does that mean? We are beings who are capable of existing and also are capable of not existing. Because once we did not exist, right? So we are beings who, could, who can exist or not exist. We are contingent beings. That's the meaning of the word contingent being. A being that may or may not exist. Now, let us compare that to another kind of being. A being that is not contingent, but is necessary. What is a necessary being? The necessary being is a being that cannot not exist. It must always exist, of necessity. That's why it is a necessary being. So what do you mean when you say it is necessary? A thing is necessary when it cannot be otherwise than what it is, okay? That is what you mean when you talk about necessary. A thing is necessary when it cannot be otherwise than what it is. So a being is necessary when, a necessary being is necessary when it cannot not exist. It must always exist of necessity. Okay? Now, in the case of the necessary being, that being because it cannot be otherwise than exist, is its own cause of existence. We contingent beings are not the cause of our existence because we may exist or not exist. What makes us exist is the cause that brings us existence. All right? Now, Now, we know very well that our universe, the things existing in our universe, are all contingent. They may or may not exist, they're brought into existence as we already exemplified earlier, okay? Now, we also know from science, we also know from science that We don't have only one universe. There are many universes. That's why we call them the multiverse. 
many, many universes. Well, of course, the theory starts with the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory was started by a great scientist who happened to be a Catholic priest. No, his name was George Lemaitre. Now, the Americans would call it George Lemaitre. No, but if he is French, the name would be George Lemaitre. No, he came up with the theory that all the things we see in the universe, etc., and so on, they all started from the tiniest speck, a tiny speck that contained infinite energy and infinite density. And that thing, after a certain time, expanded so rapidly. Some say it exploded. And in exploding, it sent, it went out, hurtling out in space, and you had the helium gases and the hydrogen gases and so on, forming stars. And these stars exploded again. And when the stars exploded, some of them cooled and contracted after millions, hundreds, and billions of years. They contracted, they cooled, and became planets. So, what does that theory say? It says that ours is only one of the many universes that exist. Huh? Now, notice our universe, just like other universes, exists, but there are in our universe different kinds of phenomena. One of the phenomena we have is there is what you call disorder, randomness. Things are just happening without any plan. They just happen, they explode here and there, they start combining, etc. No plan, it's just random. But in other parts of the universe, it's not all random. There is what you call order. That's the reason why there is science. Because in science, science presupposes a regularity or pattern of behavior of things. Because there is order. If there were no order, there would be no science. See? So you have then different combinations. Parts where there is order parts where there is disorder and disarray, all random. But the point is, our universe also is undergoing certain changes. Certain things existing before no longer exist. Some things not existing then begin to exist. In other words, our universe is also a changing thing. Now, since it is possible also for our universe to exist in a way that is not the same, in the same manner that is, in other words, our universe, no, our universe exists in a certain manner. But it is also possible for this same universe to exist in some other manner. And since that is possible, that means that the universe in which we live is also contingent. Since it is contingent, see, it is possible for it to exist in some other manner. It is also possible for it not to exist at all. See? Since it is possible for it not to exist at all and possible to exist in some other ways, since it is contingent, then our universe does not contain its own cause of existence. If the universe does not contain its own cause of existence, that means there is nothing to prevent our universe 
from ceasing to exist. For the universe to continue existing, there must be something that preserves its continuing existence. And that thing that preserves the continuing existence of the universe cannot be a natural thing. It would have to be a supernatural thing, a necessary being, and that being is God. Okay? Now, so much for that. What have we done? We have tried to show that whether you believe that the world had a beginning or you believe that the world did not have any beginning, the conclusion is still that there is God. God is the supreme being that is the uncaused cause of everything existing that is all powerful and that preserves the continuing existen existence of all things. All right? Now, but if you were to talk to an atheist who says there is no God and you try to prove to him God exists in the method I just showed you, you have just talked to him about the God of the philosopher. A God who is almighty, all-powerful, preserving the existence of everything, but you have not shown him that you have not convinced him yet that there is that that same God who is all-powerful is also all-loving and is all concerned about saving the souls of the men, the creatures he has created in his own image and likeness. You have not established that yet. You have only shown that the God of philosophers exists, but not the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. That is where faith comes in. So that is now the interrelationship between natural reason and faith. Where reason ends, faith begins. How else can you show or can you be convinced that God really is loving unless he reveals himself to you and tells you, here is my own heart. Because of my love for mankind, I am now giving you my only son. He has to reveal that because natural reason cannot discover that. That has to come from God himself. Okay? That's the relationship there. There is where you find natural reason and faith complementing each other. There they coincide. Okay? So, do not believe, therefore, that reason, the truth of reason, contradicts the truth of faith. Of course, that's not true. That can never be true. Because truth cannot contradict truth. The only thing that can contradict truth is falsity or that which is false. And if it is true in natural reason and true in, in faith, they can only complement each other, never contradict each other. Okay? All right. So be confident. If you come across scientists who tell you all this garbage about God not existing, Dismiss him. He doesn't know what he's saying. He's talking beyond this area of competence. It's just like the physicist who says, oh, colors. Uh, physics studies colors. Light passes through a prism. You get all sorts of different colors and so on. And then uh, an artist comes in, or, or let's say he talks about sound, the different kinds of sound, the levels of sound. Now the piano player says, all right, on these notes, this sound are captured in the notes, the, the keyboard, the piano. Then the pianist will say to the physicist, by the way, how do you like the composition of Rachmaninoff? Do you find it beautiful? 
do you find it beautiful music? If you are asking that question for a physicist to answer from the standpoint of physics, he cannot answer that question because physics is not concerned with the beauty of music. It is concerned with atoms. It's concerned with observable phenomena, but not with beauty. But the physicist cannot say, well, that does not exist because physics cannot explain that. Now, that's the same attitude. Same thing happens when the physicist says, there is no God. Dismiss him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Please, go ahead. The purpose of cutting you off is for you to eat while Kaloy continue. Okay. For those of you who doesn't know one of our members, Kaloy Palat, he's also a philosopher. Hindi nga lang UST, but from the University of Paganism, UP. Okay. Ikaw na, Kaloy. But you know, being from the University of, Phil of the Philippines, this has been very good training for me because most of my professors were either atheists or agnostics. And the ones who were agnostics were, free think were really free thinkers, liberals. So in my time in UP, I was already exposed to all sorts of arguments against the existence of God. And last but not the least, my own father was an atheist. So, <laughs> so I, I'm quite familiar with these things. Uh, Tony was speaking actually about the classic or the five ways of proving the existence of God, although he reduced them to three. Yung the uncaused cause, the first or prime mover, at yung argument of necessity or contingency. However, he also mentioned that the God of the philosophers is not yet the God of faith. We have, there, there has to be a jump. Okay. When speaking about the existence of God, of course, there's only one God, right? There's only one God. And the existence of this God is proven by reason. But the moment you have proven that God exists, that doesn't mean that you have already proven that Christianity is correct. After proving the existence of God, logically, you still have to prove, all right, so there's a God. What does that imply? And what are the further steps you still need to take in order to be open to the gift of faith? I also say open to the gift of faith because reason can never induce faith. Okay? It can only prepare your mind and your heart to receive faith. But being, uh, d despite knowing all of the proofs about the existence of God, that will not necessarily predispose you or make it necessary for you to convert. There has always to be that one final jump of faith. Uh, so Tony has already spoken about God as the uncaused cause, God as the first mover, the necessity of God you know, to, of, to underpin everything here on earth. So that tells us a variety of things. First and foremost, religions that are essentially atheistic cannot be true. Believe it or not, there are religions that are essentially atheistic. One classic example is traditional Buddhism. Yes, yes. Just because a religion teaches the existence of what in philosophy are called metaphysical beings does not mean that it is not atheistic. Okay. Atheism denies the existence of a one God who is the source of everything, who is the power behind everything, that created everything. That is what atheism denies. It is perfectly theoretically possible to have an atheism that denies the existence of one God, of one supreme God, while admitting the existence of lesser metaphysical beings. Buddhism is a classic example. It does not actually have, it does not actually have an idea, at least in, in its more, in its more, in its forms that are closer to the Theravada, you know, or the Theravada Buddhism in those forms. They have all sorts of gods with a small g. They have all sorts of spiritual beings. They have all sorts of you know, enlightened beings, Buddhas, but those beings are not God as we understand God 
in the Western tradition. Okay. Hinduism is the same thing. That's why in Hinduism and in Buddhism, the, comp the, the real goal is not salvation. Salvation, which we Christians and even the Jews and the Muslims understand as dwelling with God forever. For us, that is salvation. In the Eastern religions, salvation, it's not really salvation. They speak of nirvana or nibbana or moksha, which is that final disappearance of your individuality into a realm that is beyond being and beyond non-being. So, actually, another major difference between the monotheistic tradition of that you know, the tradition of religions that believe in the existence of one God and the Eastern tradition, which is Hinduism, Buddhism. As a general rule, the Eastern religions tend to deny the rule of non-contradiction. They do not uphold it as, as strongly as the Western tradition does, which is why you can, have, you can have a situation, for example, where you would have Hindus and Buddhists debating and coming to the conclusion that they really believe in the same religion, you know, things like that, or they would argue that that Buddha really was an avatar of Vishnu, who was sent in order to deceive the evil ones and bring them out of Hinduism, blah, blah, blah. You have this tendency in the East to syncretism, to join together various religions. If you watch the funeral of King Bhumipal online, you may have noticed that the gigantic temple, the wooden temple that was constructed around his, crem around his, crematory, around his crematory pile, in addition to Buddhist elements, it also had a lot of Hindu deities. Because apparently, in Thai Buddhism, there's a very strong Hindu element in Buddhism. So you have this amalgam, this mixture of religions. And it calls, all boils down to the fact that they, den they deny the existence of a one supreme God that has taught one supreme truth. Okay. When you do not have the very concept of a one supreme God that has one supreme truth, then it becomes possible for even the most contradictory religions and even the most contradictory philosophies to be held together on the plea that they are all really just the same. And may kita nyo tong influence na to sa ating mundo sa new age, Diba? It's a new age, it's a secularist thinking. By denying that there can be one God, you are also denying that there is one truth. So all of a sudden, truth becomes something relative, tangi uh, no, relative, changeable, um, multifarious, multifaceted. Wala na yung one truth. Kaya yung one God at one truth, magkakambal yan. The moment you deny that there can be only one God, or that there is one supreme God, the moment you deny that, you also destroy all basis for believing that there is only one truth. Okay. That is a very important thing to keep in mind. That is why we make a distinction between the traditional or the great monotheistic religions and the oriental religions. Now, it is true that among some of the oriental religions, especially in Hinduism, some strains of Hinduism and some strains of Buddhism, there is a strong monotheistic bent. Totoo yun. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, ang Hinduism, for example, ng Bali, Balinese Hinduism, which is very different from the Hinduism in India, they have, they have a strong tendency towards one God. And even in Hinduism, there's a tendency to consider all of their millions of gods as just multifaceted you know, facets. Parang, the, ang, ang analogy nila madalas dyan, diamond. They're the facets of one big diamond of one God. Okay. But it can also be argued that the idea of monotheism in the Eastern religions is itself an influence of Christianity, Judaism, and Buddhism. Eh, I'm sorry, Christianity, Juda Judaism, and Islam. Kasi ang mundo naman natin, hindi naman compartmentalized yan. Palaging may influences from various cultures and various religions. So coming back to what I was saying, the moment you believe that there is one God, the moment that you believe that by reason you have to believe that there is one supreme God, uncaused cause, first mover, the one necessary being on, on whom all other things are contingent for their existence, ano ang lalabas dyan? You need to believe in a system 
that revolves around the existence of that kind of God. Di ba? Kailangan ganun yung Diyos mo. Kung naniniwala ka supreme yung God mo, there's one God and He's supreme and He's, yun nga, the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause, the one necessary being, then obviously you cannot believe in religions that implicitly or explicitly deny that. You need to believe in just one God. So that's the one big jump you need to make. That's the one big jump. Before you get to the, the point that you can say that reason has prepared you to accept the message of Christianity, you need that one big jump. So dun pa lang, ano na God? Ang, ang, ang ating choices agad, limited na. Ano ba yung mga religions that teach that there's this just one God? Diba? So of course, Judaism. Islam. Sikhism, which is a blend of Hindu and Islam, but they believe in just one God. You have the Zoroastrians, uh, you have the Baha'is, marami yan. but uh, essentially they all coalesce around three great choices. Christianity, Judaism, Islam. And of course, when you begin choosing among them, when you begin weighing down their, weighing their, no, weighing their uh, dito. When you begin weighing their pros and cons, you know, their yung bigat ng kanila mga arguments, you now have to consider one more big difference. The God of Judaism, of, of post-temple Judaism, and the God of Islam is a God that is one and solitary. Uh -oh. One and solitary. Those are two different concepts. Because the Christian God is one, but He is not solitary. Because He has three persons. Okay. There's a communion in that one God. There's a community in that one God, a community of persons, not Lucila. Now, of course, uh, just like uh, just like Tony Ross' explanation kanina of the five proofs of the existence of God, this is a very complicated topic. Maraming ramifications. Okay? Maraming ramifications. But consider this. Does God, you know, does God have perfect comprehension of himself? Does God have perfect comprehension of himself? Malamang. If God doesn't know who he is totally, completely, eh hindi siya Diyos. Diba? Hindi siya Diyos. Now, have you ever considered how you think? How we people think? Diba? When you look at something, or when you think of yourselves, Diba? For example, lahat na, si, si Henry, when he thinks about, when Henry C. thinks about Henry C. Or Carlos Palad thinks about Carlos Palad, or you think about yourself. Nagkakaroon ka ng idea. Diba? You have an idea in your mind of who you are. No matter how incomplete, no matter how uh, erroneous, Baka sila sabi sa sarili ko, ako, gwapo ako, hindi eh, naman yung ganun. For example, di ba? Or, or uh, actually, payat na payat ako eh, pero hindi naman, di ba? So, I, I may have that erroneous self-image of myself. But God, it's not possible for God to have an erroneous self-image of Himself. He has a perfect self-image of Himself or a perfect image of Himself. Now, do you understand why we Christians speak of the Son as the image of the Father? That's where it comes. The Father, precisely by comprehending Himself, now when, he, when the Father, God the Father, has an image, so to speak, of Himself, when He contemplates, and when he contemplates Himself, when He, so to speak, thinks of Himself, He has a perfect image of who He is. He has a perfect image of who he is. When God thinks about himself, knows himself, he has a perfect self-image of, him, of himself. And that perfect self-image, to be really perfect, has to be a perfect, okay, to use imperfect human language, no? 
has to be a perfect copy of himself, so to speak. That's why we speak of the Son being equal to the Father because the Son is the image of the Father. So what in Christianity we really go beyond Judaism and Islam is because we think about how God, we think about the psychology of God himself. We delve into that. We delve into that. Unlike in Judaism and Islam, where God is basically left as, oh, okay, isang Diyos, siya lang. Mag-isa lang siya dyan. Pero tayo, Kristiyano, we go further, of course, with the help of divine revelation. Kasi ang isang teaching rin ng Christianity, yung teaching ng ano, yung teaching on the Holy Trinity is given to us through divine revelation. Because without divine revelation, we would not have known about the Trinity. But just because we would not have known about the divine, about Trinity without the divine revelation, that does not mean that reason cannot help us to understand divine revelation. Reason can still help us to comprehend what divine revelation teaches. Kaya nga tayo mga katoliko, meron tayong development of doctrine din. Kasi we understand that by using our reason, by using our natural gifts, we can delve deeper and deeper and deeper into the teachings given to us by divine revelation. So, doon pala, may kita mo, meron na sa, in, in Christianity, we already believe in that this God, the one God, is not a solitary God. He has an image of himself. And this is what we call the Son. And between the Son, who is an image, a perfect, complete image of the Father, and the Father, there is love. Ba? There is love. Do you love yourselves? You love yourselves, right? And this happened just then. Ba? But when you say you love yourselves, what do you really mean? You love what you think of yourselves. Ba? Meron kayong self-idea na sarili ninyo. Yun ang minamahal ninyo. Even if it's not perfect, if it's a, not a perfect image, kasi no one here has a complete and total and infallible self-knowledge of himself. Just lang ang may ganun. And that love, ano ba ang definition natin ng love? Total self-giving. So the father contemplating his own image in his mind, so to speak, no? loves the image that he has of himself. And that image loves the father back. That mutual river of love is what we call the Holy Spirit. Okay. So you see, yung Trinity does not necessarily mean that there are three different gods. It does not necessarily mean that there are three different gods. It simply is Our, it simply shows how when you really understand what God is and what he is capable of, that's what happens. He is a God who has a perfect image of himself, the Son, and between that perfect self-image of himself and himself, the Father, there is perfect love and that is the Holy Spirit. This is a very deep mystery to Toyon, but reason can help us to understand it. Kaya nga sa Catholic Christology, So much energy is poured into understanding yung, yung thinking, so to speak, no? yung divine thinking. We, while, all of the, while understanding all the time that human language cannot adequately or completely grasp yung meaning, yung talagang, ano, yung talagang depth, no? yung talagang complete depth no nangyayari sa kaloob-looban ng Diyos. Uh, to give you an idea no, how difficult it can be to, to explain what this is, let me share with you a personal experience. personal experience. No? As you know, I edited the revised edition of the Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, which will be published early next year under Dr. Robert Fastigi. And I remember Dr. Robert Fastigi and I were discussing what to do with the German phrase that literally would mean that the holy spirit that the son comes from the womb of the father something like that from the womb of the father so they, um, if we turn this into literal english they would think a lot of people would think that god is some sort of feminine 
<laughs> so we had to look for, we had to beat around a number of times for a less literal but equally accurate way of describing the same thing. We settled on that he, we settled on that the second person of the Blessed Trinity comes from within the interior of the Father. Okay. Tinanggal niya word na womb. Because if that's translated literally into English, imagine the controversy that would arise, diba? Even the older English translation avoided the term womb. But in the original German, it was womb, the womb of the Father. Just to, I, I gave that explanation just to illustrate how difficult and sensitive it could be to describe the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. That is why the Catholic Church is so insistent on the importance of precise doctrinal formulations that you cannot go beyond one word, you cannot subtract one word. Diba sa Apostles' Creed, sa Nicene Creed, sa Athanasian Creed, which is the longest and the least known of them. Iba't iba pang creeds. Ang daming creeds and napaka-precise ng formulation. Kasi the moment you go beyond these formulations, one word more, one word less, baka mali na siya. And in philosophy, in Christian philosophy, there is the added challenge of trying to understand yung, yung, ano, yung nature of God using purely human language where divine revelation is only an extern of external assistance. When you're discussing Christian philosophy, you don't, use, you don't, you don't bandy around the Bible. You know? It's because the Bible says you don't do that in, you don't do that in philosophy. No? Of course, yung, yung laman ng Christian philosophy cannot contradict what the Bible says. It cannot contradict what the Bible says. But you do not use the Bible as your main proof text when doing Christian philosophy. So, medyo napaikot-ikot tayo. But the point there was to show to you, there is a uniqueness in the Christian view of God that is both philosophically defensible, philosophically credible, and which also makes it very different from, Christ, from Islam and from Judaism. You know why? Because Christ, Christian philosophy, even though it is just philosophy, it shows a level of desire, a level of understanding of the intimate workings of God himself that in Judaism and in Islam, they would not dare. Why? Because unlike in, Jude in, unlike in post temple Judaism, or at least some strains of it, and unlike in Islam, our vision of God is dominated by one thing. For us, God is a loving father. And that loving father, you do not fear. Of course, there's that holy fear, no? but the fear is filial, the way you fear a loving father. Okay. So, you see, yung, I don't know, kanina, four years, two, four years, two hours, no? <laughs> so, talaga, ang dami-dami mga jumps, ang dadaming controversies. But what, what I'm trying to, what we're trying to convey here is the richness of the Catholic tradition. No? It's just, it's not just about, ano, it's not just about, it's not just about Bible verses. It's not just about history. It's not just about philosophy even. It's one big whole. And probably no other religion has the like of it. No? Has the like of it na walang, na hindi riddled with self-contradictions. No? So, so that is one of the attractions of Christianity. One of the ways by which you can jump from the God of the philosophers to the God of Isaac the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. Okay, so I'm going to hand over the mic back to to Tony. Nakain na kayo? Okay. Thank you so much, Kaloy, for relieving me of hunger. You know what, I really want to thank Aloy for uh, being a very more than capable uh, support system because, well, I won't go into details, but I thought I wouldn't be able to come today. So I asked Henry, please make sure 
that we have somebody to speak, then who could be better than Kaloy? So I really want to thank Kaloy and Henry for, and of course, Mr. Joynak for all the, you are the cause and we are the effects. <laughs> okay, so. <coughs> Oh, yeah. I shall now move into a topic which is also philosophical. But we shall now go into the proof of the existence of the human soul. That the human soul exists that the human soul is immaterial, that the human soul is immortal. When the body dies, the soul lives on. Huh? From natural reason. From natural reason. Okay. Uh, Let us say this drawing represents a man we call Peter. Peter has certain physical characteristics. He has color. Let's say he's brown. Let's say he's six feet tall. Let's say it's about 200 pounds. Let's say it's got curly hair. Uh, and other characteristics. I don't want to encourage you smelling Peter because you might be mistaken for a transgender. <laughs> anyway, uh, texture of skin. Etc. The man called Peter in reality, the man called Peter in reality has certain physical qualities, characteristics. There is color which the eyes pick up. Maybe as a sonorous voice, which hearing picks up. Texture of skin, maybe smooth. Height, pounds, etc. All the different characteristics he might have. Notice that all of these characteristics that Peter has, are picked up by our external senses. The eyes will perceive color. The ears will hear, will hear sound. So all of these things picked up by the physical organs that we have, external senses, are now carried by the nerve impulses 
to a certain part of the brain. In the case of sight, occipital lobe. And all the others to different areas, including the internal senses called imagination and memory. Okay? When you see the man called Peter, these physical characteristics that you now perceive and are now entering also the memory and the imagination in the form of an image. All represent the man called Peter in reality. Now, when that happens, the mind now bears upon, focuses on this image, and from that image, it abstracts or draws out, it draws out his nature. The mind now draws out from the image the nature of man. Man. Having that as an idea now in the mind, when the mind draws out the essence or the nature of man, that essence or that concept of man exists in the mind in such a way that man can now be affirmed of Peter. So you can now say Peter is a man. But it is not only Peter to which man is applied. You can say that same concept of man drawn out from the image of Peter applies to Peter, applies, applies to Paul, applies to John, applies to others. So in other words, this can be asserted. The idea you have can now be asserted of Peter, Mark, John, uh, Santiago, or whoever it is. All men, in short. Huh? Now, why is it... Yeah, by the way, the image here, which was taken out from this individual sense data, only represent the image of Peter. But the concept of man that you drew out from the image of Peter applies not only to Peter, but all men. So what do you notice here? One, the idea is a universal. So the idea is the universal representation of what a thing is. And that's the reason why you have sciences, because you can now speak of universals. You can say, uh, this is, let's say, oxygen is an element, or hydrogen is an element. You can apply the concept of element to all, to all the chemicals that you have there. I mean, elements, no? Where there are specific, specific elements. The concept of element is also universal that applies to all individual elements. Now, another thing to, because this is a universal, it represents a class, a class of beings, the being of man. That applies to Peter, Paul, Mary, and everybody else, no? It's a class of beings. But the organs that we have, the question arises, is it possible that the universal idea
Is it possible that Is it possible that the concept or your idea now of man was produced by the brain? Is it possible for the brain to produce an idea? Now notice, the brain is the center of our nervous system. It picks up all sense impress impressions all sense data, they are all transmitted to the brain. Now, to the nerves, no? The nerve, uh, <coughs> neural, neural network, neurotransmission. When all these things are sent to the brain, they are impressions that have to do only with singular objects. Singular objects. That's why, uh, Brown, picked up by the sense of sight, is transmitted to the brain. Height, texture, etc., they're all transmitted to the brain. Now, the brain in itself produces an image, but that image represents only Peter, from which all of the sense data came from. This image cannot apply to other human beings, but only to Peter. Why? Because the brain, being particular, being a singular uh, organ, no? the central organ, can only produce singular or individual sense data. No? Uh, it can only process individual sense data resulting in individual objects. The brain cannot produce a universal idea. No way. Because what is universal is a class. And our brain cannot produce the concept of a class. It can only produce an image of a particular thing, nothing more, okay? Now, since this is the case, and the universal, which is an idea, universal representation of a thing, that is the idea which the mind produces, what does this mean? Since a universal cannot be produced by any physical organ. Neither can a universal be produced by the brain. It being universal, it can only be immaterial. It can only be produced by a knowing faculty, a knowing power in man that is not material. Or not material meaning it is immaterial. And that immaterial knowing faculty is the mind. The mind. The mind, or sometimes we call it the intellect. The intellect. Mind or intellect. And now let's repeat that. From a specific individual, you have certain physical sense data. It's picked up by the different senses that we have, deposited in a part of the brain that forms an image. But that image also is a specific image of the specific object, Peter, in reality. The brain does not produce an idea of Peter. It only produces an image of Peter because the brain only can produce a specific thing, not something that is universal. 
as a concept. Okay? Therefore, since we have been asked now, the idea of man, which is a universal concept applying not only to Peter but all men, then that is only possible if what is universal is also not material or immaterial. Okay? Now, since what is immaterial cannot be the work of something material, it follows that the mind or the intellect is an immaterial knowing power of man. That is what differentiates man from the rest of the animal kingdom. In the animal kingdom, we have like animals, external senses. Other animals, brutes, they can see, they can smell, they can taste, they can touch. All the things that the senses, perhaps they're even more sensitive, more as acute senses, no? Like dogs have a sharper hearing, some have sharper smell than human beings. But that's all they can do. It still is on the sensory level, okay? It is only man that is radically distinct in kind from the rest of the animal kingdom. They used to say, there are three mysteries in science that science cannot explain. One, how something can come from nothing. Two, how living things can come from non-living things. And three, how is it that man among living things is the only one who understands good and evil, right and wrong. Okay? Now let's go into that. So if the mind and intellect or the intellect of man are the knowing powers in man which are immaterial, the question, is it possible that this immaterial knowing power is part of a material organ? Of course it's not possible. So if it cannot be part of a material organ, it has to be a part of an immaterial entity called the human soul. So the human soul is what gives life to the body, makes it carry out the functions, vital functions proper to a living thing, and at the same time, our soul is a rational soul which has the power to think which all other animals in the animal kingdom cannot carry out, okay? That's the reason why even the smartest dolphin or the smartest animal you have will never be able to compose beautiful music. None of them will become mathematicians. None of them will be able to recite or compose a beautiful poem because they don't have a mind that the human being has. You go out to the province, you see the beautiful sights, especially during sunrise and sunsets, when you see the setting sun cast along a beautiful sky and you somehow romanticize and you think of the beauty of nature, you are seeing the very same thing that a carabao sees. You enjoy the beauty of the sunset, the carabao sees the same thing, but it does not think of poetry. It will just think of grass. Huh? Now that's the difference. We have a thinking soul that is capable of knowing, producing ideas. Now, so it is the intellect that produces the idea which is universal and which is also immaterial. So thinking per se, the act of thinking or understanding is not a work of the brain. It's a work of the intellect, the mind. Of course, 
the mind also needs the brain. Why? Because the brain is needed to be able to pick up all of the sense data from where, from which you form the image and from which the mind is going to extract the essence into an idea. So the brain is a necessary condition for thinking because of those. But it is not the sufficient reason for thinking. The sufficient reason for thinking is, the sufficient cause for thinking is the mind. Because it is that which produces the idea. Okay? And in producing the idea, the mind carries out the act of understanding, not the brain. So the mind is capable of operating by itself when it understands. See? It is understanding. But we need the brain, as we said, for the beginning stages of thinking. All right? Now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now. Uh, the act of understanding, sometimes we call it intellection, the intellect at work, understanding. The proof for the immortality of the human soul. Remember, the intellect or the mind that we call it is part of the human soul. They are powers of the human soul. The will is also a power of the human soul. Now, <clears throat> here is the argument. Whatever has per se operations, has per se existence. What is the meaning of per se? What, by itself. Whatever can operate by itself has per se existence. The human soul can operate by itself when it exercises the act of understanding. So whatever has per se operations has per se existence. The human soul has per se operations. Therefore, the human soul has per se existence. What does that mean? The human soul can exist by itself. After death, when the body corrupts, the human soul lives on. The human soul, therefore, is immortal. Now, but that is only as far as philosophy goes, natural reason goes. Now, the question to ask is, how does the human soul exist apart from the body? That is left to faith. That is left to divine revelation. Natural reason cannot go beyond its natural frontiers. Okay? So we leave that to God's revelation and what will take place when we all go. Now, I'll take up one last point about what is often asked about the Blessed Mother. No? Why pray to the Blessed Mother? Why, in, in, in scriptures, in scriptures it is said, uh, the mediator between the Father and mankind is Jesus Christ. All right? Since he is the mediator, why do you still call on the saints? Why do you still call on the Blessed Mother? Why do you still call on the angels to help you and so on? Why not just call on Christ? Right? He is the mediator. And in scriptures, no one can deny that. Now, the reason is this. You see... In the greatest commandment, when our Lord was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest is to love God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole strength. And the second is like the first, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, follow that up now with a prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray. First part, we know the first part. The second part, give us this day our daily bread. Christ did not say, give me this day my daily bread. He said, give us. So you're asking not only for you, but for your neighbor. And forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass. In other words, forgive us our, tre us our trespasses, not I for forgive me my sins, only my neighbors too, please. Why? Because that is the second commandment, loving neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, then any good you ask God, you will also ask for your neighbor. And to top it all, our Lord himself says, pray for those, those who persecute you. Pray for your, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. What is he saying? We are supposed to intercede for our own enemies and ask God, please, for your sake, I forgive him. Please forgive him too. And grant him the grace of conversion. That's what you say. What are you doing when you say that? You are mediating between that man and God. Question, but isn't there only one mediator? Christ? Well, that's the real thing you must pay attention to. Because when it is said that Christ is the mediator between God and mankind, that does not mean he is the only mediator what he is saying, he is the primary mediator because he's teaching us to pray in behalf of other people, to mediate in behalf of other people. What he's saying is, you must also be my secondary mediators. Okay? That is meant. In other words, the Christian religion is intercessory. You keep mediating because that is the work of love. Okay? Now, when Sodom and Gomorrah were about to be destroyed, Abraham went to the Lord and said, if I can find 50 people, will you spare Sodom and Gomorrah? Good people, good people, just people. The Lord said, okay, for the sake of the 50, I'll spare Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham went there. He couldn't find 50. So he went back to God and said, if I find 40, will you spare Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, for the sake of the 40, I will. Until it came to one man. Wala pa rin. So he had to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What was the lesson from that? The Lord listens to the prayers of a just man. But notice, if the Lord listens to the prayers of a just man, how, in spite of the fact that that just man, who is still a potential sinner, can still sin, how much more if it comes to the prayers of those who can no longer sin, like the saints in heaven, like his own mother? With all the more reason, God will answer those prayers. So, what have we said? We have said that it is wrong to think that because Christ is the mediator between God and man, he is the only mediator. He has deputized us to be his secondary or even tertiary mediators. Maybe the secondary mediators who did the Blessed Mother and all the angels and saints in heaven. We are the tertiary mediators. Okay? All right. So with that, uh, wait, one last thing, the, the cult of the Blessed Mother. All right. That part is clear, no? About mediation and so on. Now, can you imagine you believe that God made things out of nothing? You believe he can do that? Yes. No, that's creation. Now, if he can do that, what if he, cre he created all of mankind in the same way that he created Adam and Eve? No parents. Right? Can he do that? Yes, if he wanted to. However, he didn't do it that way. Why? Because if he had created all of us without parents, there would be no such thing as the love of a father for a child. No paternal love. There would be no such thing as the love of a mother for the child. No maternal love. There would be no such thing as the love of a child for parents. No filial love. No filial devotion. And there would be no love of a brother for a sister or a brother, a brother, and so on. No fraternal love. 
That's why he gave us parents. He made sure that the rest of mankind we'd, would be generated from parents. Now, could the Father who is all-powerful, could he have created Jesus Christ without parents, the, the body of Jesus Christ? Of course he could, right? If he wanted to, he could have done it that way. But he didn't choose to do it that way. He chose that Jesus Christ would be born of a human being preserved from sin. That's the reason why when angel Gabriel appeared to Mary one day and said, Mary, you have found favor with the Most High. And full of grace, you have found favor with the Most High, meaning God the Father. And you will bear his son. Mary, of course, for a while was wondering how, because she said, how can this be when I know not man? Because Mary, like the many young virgins of their time, offered themselves in the temple in perpetual virginity. So, in other words, is God now releasing me from my vow of perpetual virginity so that I can now bear a child? And then the angel reassured her. He said, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit will cover you. In other words, it will be the work of God that, to the work of God, that you will have a child in your womb. And what did she say? She said, be it done to me according to your word. Notice, the father did not use brute force. He did not say to the Blessed Mother, look, I created you. You are everything that you are because of me. He did not do it that way. He invited her. He waited for her free consent to accept the role to become the mother of his own son. Through invitation, your free choice. And she accepted that. When she accepted that, be it done to me according to thy word, then the Holy Spirit formed the body of Jesus Christ in a womb. So, when that happened, what in effect really took place? The acceptance, the free acceptance to be the mother, the free consent that Mary gave to be the mother of the Son of God. And the conception that took place of the body of our Lord Jesus in a womb, was already the beginning of the New Testament. The New Testament started with the consent of Mary. That's what we owe her because she freely consented to be the mother of God. Now, when that began, in effect, what had Mary done? She provided the door through which God would enter the world of mankind. See? And at the same time, she was the same door through which mankind would enter the world of God. So that is why in the litany, gate of heaven, that's the one. Okay? So when Mary assumed that role, she was effectively already interceding for all of mankind. That's the reason why we say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Because there alone, that act was already a prayer for mankind. So we are only uttering in words what she had already done in action long ago. And still keeps doing on now. And that's why our Blessed Mother is so intimately related to the heart of God. To the Father, the most obedient child. To the Son, the Mother of the Son and to the Spirit, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So there is no intercessor next to our Lord Jesus Christ who is more powerful than the Blessed Virgin Mary. That is why if you want peace, listen to the prayer and the request of our Blessed Mother. Say the rosary. Because the rosary 
was a prayer that our Blessed Mother revealed and gave to Saint Dominic to be able to defeat the Albigensian heresy. When there is so much sin in the world, when there is so much uh, disorder, moral chaos, say the rosary. Draw ourselves closer to the sacraments. Know the life of Christ. Know Christ. Let us try to know Christ intimately by knowing his personal life, by reading scriptures. But we need the life of the sacraments. And then, second only to the sacraments, the rosary. Now, one last point. Why do we go to Mass? Okay? Why do we go to Mass? It is said that in all the prayers that we have in our Catholic faith, the Mass is the summit and the center of our Christian worship. Why? Because in the Mass, it is the Son of God himself who is offered to the Father in heaven. And since the Father does never refuses the Son, he accepts the Son and accepts all that the Son carries with him, all who attend that Mass and all their prayers. See? So the the solely sacrifice of the Mass is a re-presentation of the sacrifice of our Lord in Calvary. In Calvary, he was sacrificed and offered to the Father. But it was a physical sacrifice. It was a bloody sacrifice. In the case of the Mass, he is offered to the Father in a bloodless but mystical sacrifice. Now, Related to the Mass, sorry. Huh? The Eucharist. The Eucharist, communion. Oh. You see a piece of bread and you see wine. Now, uh, what is our belief? That those turn into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Okay, now, you see... We know what ice is, yellow. Do you have ice? To ordinary means you put heat. Ice is water, no? That will melt into liquid water. You put more heat, that will turn into gas, but still water. You have changed from solid to liquid to gas. You have changed the appearance, but you have not changed the substance. The ordinary means. If we can change the substance, I mean the appearance, if we can change the appearance without changing the substance, God who is all-powerful can change the substance without changing the appearance. Okay? That is the Holy Eucharist. All right, so that's all. And... Let's keep praying for each other and let's hope and pray that the kingdom of our Lord, Jesus Christ, will keep reigning in our hearts and in our country. God bless you all. And di tayo nagkamali, talagang malalim, no? So you are now a philosopher. <laughs> and you are a graduate seminarians. <laughs> okay, so we've been blessed tonight to have Tony and uh, we've been attentive. Uh, as again, a plea for assistance that we may continue. The, the, the reason is this is our last lecture. We appeal to you to help us in our apostolate to help us uh, propagate the faith to millions of Catholic worldwide by a uh, Facebook live so uh, and then ag again also we will pass on paper so that you can write down your questions so so Q&A we'll, we'll have some overtime today being the last uh, last uh, lecture 615 
6.15. Sa, oh, by the way, if you want to go to anticipated mass, we have a mass here at Sanctuario at 6.15. Okay. So, let me... Kanina nabanggit ko na, pero mas madami tayo ngayon. Next week is our party. It will be held here at 8 o'clock. We ask you to wear something color orange. Orange tayo. So that pag nag-photo op tayo, pare-pareho. Huwag kang magsasot ng brown. <laughs> so, ito, orange tayo. Not necessarily this, but you can buy any orange. However, this is a Toto shirt, no? It's on sale, 450. Pero get the supply while it lasts, no? Uh, this is the uh, orange with Etcom Espiritu 2 on the on the shirt. Just uh, notice that uh, once you completed the uh, apologetics, kabit kabit na in Christology natin, sacraments, communion of saints, no? And then uh, it is now deeply. Uh, it's standing on a very solid ground of philosophy. No? So, we encourage you to go go deeper in your studies of philosophy. Now, ang maganda sa Defensores is you have consultants or mentors. You can ask Aloy through email sa Facebook or Defensores sa email, PM. If you have any questions about the faith, magkakasama tayo, wala tayo iwanan. So, pag na-confront na kayo, medyo ma mahirap na tanong, Kailo, ikaw mag-ask uh, uh, ng question. Ito na sa'yo. So, don't forget, this is just an introductory, <laughs> parang hindi introductory, no? Introductory on philosophy. Uh, you have all the necessary tools to 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 be able to learn and explain and defend the teaching of the church. But don't stop reading, don't stop learning. Okay? Uh, so, 8 o'clock next week, from 8 to 10, we, oh, you, you are welcome to join us for, but you have to sign up. From 8.30 to 10 o'clock, we'll have a talk of Ed De Bera author of Catholic Soul and the Mysteries of Salvation History. And then at 10 o'clock, we'll have a mass at Holy Family. Hindi pa, kalo hindi pa anticipated yun, you know? It's a regular mass, but uh, it will be a Nobus Ordo, Kaloy. It will, it will be in Latin, okay? But of course, the reading and the homily will be in English. And then after the mass, we will go to Max Restaurant across the sa alam niyo Max no kalinya ng ng McDonald's and then yung Max Restaurant. So for those of you hindi pa nag sign up sign up na. For those of you you think it will be hard up for the, to come out with the 350. Sabihin niyo lang we'll look for sponsors to to take care of that. 200 pesos kung gusto niyo sumali sa exchange gift. Okay? This year, this year, 2017, Kaloy will have the largest number of completed mga participants who completed the, the course. So I congratulate to, to the members here. Oh, why don't you give a round of applause to, to our struggle? Yeah. By, by the mere fact that we, we spend time to learn the faith, it's really grace from God. To be here, it's al already a grace from God. Okay, so we'll continue. We'll go over time. Explain ko na lang sa, okay, the benefactors, the owner of Pamichi allowed us to use the room so that uh, we can still continue to propagate. Include, include defensores in your prayers. Include every one of us in your prayers. As, I, as Tony said, there's a communion of saints Sama-sama tayo magdasal sa kapwa natin. Are you ready with your question? Okay. Kaloy, you come up, come up here, Kaloy. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> we got a very substantial uh, lecture today, and as I was listening to Sir, I just it just flashed back into my mind. Way back, I taught introduction to philosophy for two semesters, and I hope I have done justice to my students. 
<laughs> para sabi ko, teka lang pa rin hindi ko ata naintindihan it that way before. <laughs> I hope I got it very well. Anyways, we started the first question. Um, since we were discussing on philosophy, can you recommend a book so that we can go deeper with philosophy? And the second is, when man dies, does he enter heaven as soul or both? Those are the two first two questions. First is the book, the second is the other one. Uh, if you want first, if you want to begin philosophy in light doses first, no? Uh, get hold of great ideas from the great books, pocket book, written by Mortimer J. Adler. Now, uh, if you want to uh, because Adler, by the way, is a Thomist. He is a, I, I attribute the strength and the vitality now of uh, Thomistic philosophy to him principally. Of course, Jacques Maritain came before him, Etienne Zilsong, and the other philosophers came too, including Garigou Lagrange, who was a professor of late St. John Paul when he was a student, no? But the one who really carried through the mystic philosophy and directed it not to the academe, but to the people at large, it was Mortimer Adler, the man behind great books of the Western world. So just get the pocket book. That is a slow dose, parang dextrose lang, paunti-unti, from great books, I mean, great ideas from the great books, pocket book. If you want to go into deeper readings of that, uh, you get hold of some works written, not yet by St. Thomas, no? But uh, some works uh, written by good commentaries, good commentators on the works of St. Thomas Aquinas. You can go into Jacques Maritain. You can go into Mortimer Adler's uh, you don't have to go to how, how to read a book. You can go to Conditions of Philosophy by Mortimer Adler. No? So those are the things, those are good beginnings, good starting points. The second question to Kaloy or to me? OK, uh, I'll answer the second question, then I'll go back a bit to the first. Okay. When we die? That's al this is already this is already an answer that will have to be based on Christian revelation. Okay. When we die, we enter the other world as souls. But we also believe that at one point in the future, the bodies will be resurrected. Our bodies will be resurrected to join the soul and to share the eternal fate of the soul. So body and soul will share the eternal fate. Why? Because here on earth, whatever you merited or whatever caused you to be condemned, you did so as a body and as a soul. So both body and soul have to share in either reward or punishment. Okay. Now coming back to the first, now what books to read about philosophy? Uh, we, I'll answer that on two levels. Okay. First, if you want to understand what Christian, the Christian vision of philosophy is about, one work to start with is Fides et Racho by Pope John Paul II, okay. the 1995 encyclical of Pope John Paul II on faith and reason, fides et racho. If you couldn't remember the Latin, just put in faith and reason. There are a lot of free online copies of that encyclical. It's very long, but you know, it's, if you really want to understand what Christian philosophy is all about, that's one place to start. Another place to start with, since nasa since tayo ay nasa, nasa itaas ng totus, <laughs> uh, uh, Sir Tony mentioned various authors such as Jacques Maritain and Etchen Gilson, but in addition to these authors, if you want to, to read a, essentially someone who is not generally thought of as a philosopher, but who definitely wrote with a very philosophical cast of mind. That author would be G.K. Chesterton. Okay. Chesterton. 
and you can start with what is probably his greatest book, which is The Everlasting Man. The Everlasting Man. Although that's really a mixture of film, you halo know, halo yon, philosophy, theology, but these are, these are good starting points as well. At the same time, uh, sometimes I'm asked, eh, what do you do in order to learn, in order to understand theology more? I tell them, don't just read theology books. Because if you read only theology books, if you read only religion books, you are not going to understand theology. Okay? You need to have a broader spectrum of your reading. You know? Read good literature. Yung mga, yung mga classics, yung mga literary classics. Because they put you in touch with the timeless ideas and with timeless, em timeless explanations of what the emotions are or how the heart works or how the mind works. So literature is very important. Okay? And if, you're go if you want to go into philosophy as a in general, it's good also to start a bit with the man to whom philosophy is called a series of footnotes. I'm talking about Plato. Plato has a lot of dialogues. Uh, in complete words, I'm not, I'm not telling you to read all of it. But if there is one place you can start with, it is the dialogue called Meno. M E N O, which is a, it's which is which serves as a good introduction to his entire train of thought. You know. So these are, you know, these are start these are starting points. Incidentally, kung na kung meron kayong copy ng Summa Theologia, which which is also online, mababasa nyo dun na it was written by Saint Thomas Aquinas for beginners. <laughs> yung concept nila dati ng beginners you begin with the suma and that's that is ano, yun, ganun katindi yung intellectual level ng ano ng discourse dati ngayon ngayon kahit yata post kahit yata post doc post grad ba dahil hindi na binabasa ang suma eh di ba dati beginners lang I, I i i remember reading a jesuit i think it was father robert taft who said that as late as the 1950s dati if you were a jesuit novice okay, you started where ano ka nagupi sa kapalasa jesuit ang textbook mo suma which was studied in the original latin that's how they that's how they would that's how they would have their formation. Jesuits lang yon, e Dominicans pa. Okay? Yung Dominicans hindi lang suma, yung payatang commentary ni Cajetan, di ba? <laughs> yung the the, no, the enormous commentary by Cajetan. So actually in the early 21st century we have it very very easy. So yon. So just to tell, just to give you an idea of just how vast the field really is. So, but if you really want to start, feed the Satracho, yeah, Kiplato, Meno, yeah. If you want a compass of Christian theology, read also the encyclicals of John Paul, because they're loaded. They're supercharged with lots of stuff, enlightening, uplifting. Now, speaking of the Summa Theologica, uh, when we were in college before, our professor required us to read the Summa Theologica, and we had to read to the Summa Contra Gentiles, and we went through also the commentaries of St. Thomas on the De Anime of Aristotle and the posterior analytics, a number of those. I, unfortunately, I don't see that happening now, even in the university where I came from. But just to acquaint you with a kind of education we used to have before in our country. Uh, right now, for instance, have you heard of any high school in the world that is teaching in philosophy, huh? teaching cosmology, metaphysics, epistemology, logic, and not poetry interpretation, but poetry composition. Any university in the world, any high school offering that now throughout the world? None. That was our level educa of education in 1865. You know, that was high school. Five years, fifth year high school. 
you went through that, you'd really be solid. Maybe that's the reason why it did not take a hard time for the Americans to decide to give independence to the Philippines. Because when they came over, all they knew was English. And they were surprised to be talking to our uh, leaders at that time who knew not only Spanish but could speak Latin. See? Jose Rizal, when he was in the University of Santo Tomas, one of his classmates there was the great Enrique Mendiola. They were contemporaries. And you know what kind of disputations they would have, debate? They would, uh, they would assign a topic. And the master uh, philosophers would be there, observing them and judging them. They would debate for an hour or two on an assigned topic in Latin. That was our education at the time. Now, that's the reason why we don't have to be apologetic about the quality of our education in early days. That is what the Spaniards gave us. Why? Because the Spaniards were deeply influenced by the Greeks, and they brought to us Greek culture. They wanted to turn the, our country into the Spain of Asia. They sent us the best philosophers, Severino Gonzalez, from Spain. He came to the Philippines. When he was gone in the early part of the turn of the century, we had another great Dominican philosopher whose name was Father Angel de Blas. He was the one who showed all the uh, irregularities in that claim of miracles in Lipa. You remember? Lipa of the 1949 uh, uh, incident. There was a claim that there were miracles going on. Then Father Blas went there. At that time, by the way, he was also called one of the 10 greatest, most brilliant minds of the world. He was also a clinical psychologist. As soon as he went there and investigated the claims of miracles, he saw at once it was a hoax. So, because of his testimony, his analysis and so on, Lipa phenomenon was declared not miraculous. Okay? Now, so, it helps, it helps. Uh, if you really want philosophy, please go into it also. Study it, it will help you greatly. It is not only necessary for theology, it's necessary for law, it is necessary for science. In fact, just a brief aside, the father of international law, you know how international law was born? The father of international law was a Dominican philosopher, Spanish Dominican philosopher, by the name of Francisco de Vitoria. Now, in the 16th century, when the economy of the world was rested on slave labor, remember? The wealth of the world was going on because of slave labor, practically free labor. Chow, chow labor lang, pakainin mo lang, okay na. Okay? So, he was the one who blasted for the first time in history slave labor. What did he use? His philosophy from St. Thomas. And he borrowed, of course, some premises from Holy Scriptures. Here was his argument. He said, if it is true that man was made in the image and likeness of God, then all men are created equal. If all men are created equal, then no man was born to be a slave or a master to any man. That argument was so irrefragable, so indisputable, that it shook the very foundations of world economy. And there was nothing they could do because the, 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 the strength of the argument was so solid. Even the Pope had to issue a bull saying that effective 30 days after you receive this bull, you have to release your slaves or you will be committing mortal sin. That was how it was. And he was the man who came to be known as the father of international law. 
you go to the United Nations, you will see his bust, Francisco de Vitoria, a man of philosophy and a man of God. All right, so a new question. That was so substantial. <laughs> I wish I have lived during that time <laughs> so that I could have studied Summa Theologica. But anyway, <laughs> I read that. <laughs> You're talking about the Disputationes, right? Yeah, the Disputationes in the Aula of UST. He forgot to mention one important detail. The topic of the disputation would be given that same morning. So the students, the, 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 cho the ones chosen to do the disputation, they would be told, okay, this is the topic, be prepared in a couple of hours. <laughs> be prepared in a couple of hours. So they made it in Latin in front of the professorial core of, you, of, the, uh, of the pontifical university. That is how it was like. So, okay, next question. <laughs> I read Summa Theologica when I was already taking the Christology because my <laughs> professor was a Dominican. Mm -hmm. Bewildered, my goodness. I could not understand it <laughs> because I don't have a background of <laughs> philosophy. So every now and then I, should, I, I would text him and ask him, what is this suppositum? What is this? Supposed oh my goodness, <laughs> all of those things. <laughs> and so I have to retire. <laughs> Next question. My son asked, Mom, does God plan all these things? So he knows what we do and what we don't. How come he can't stop or control us in doing bad things? That's the question. Okay. Um, because if God will not respect our free will by preventing us from doing what is bad, then neither will he have any grounds to give us reward for our merits. It's that simple. If we don't have freedom, okay, we won't do bad things, neither will we really do good things. So there's no basis for him to punish, there's also no basis for him to reward. It's that simple. Following the line of Kaloy, <clears throat> God gave us a free will. Now, however, he asks us, he invites us to use that free will to choose good and to live according to his precepts. If we do what is good, the reward comes. As Kaloy said, if we choose to do what is evil, then we have to be punished. But he does everything to see to it that we choose good. He gave us the commandments. He gave us the saving sacraments to give us the spiritual strength to do good. And he also gave us the scriptures for us to read, to know Christ personally. The only way you can know Christ personally is to read scriptures and to receive the sacraments. Because when you have the life of Christ in you, you live, you strive to live a habitual life of goodness. And when you live a life of habitual goodness, it becomes more difficult to sin. Because the good habits keep, get deeply ingrained in your soul, in your psyche, that's why the Lord can never be accused of not trying his best to save the souls. So the sacraments are all there. The examples are all in scriptures. And the strength to live according to Christ's way, truth, and life come from the sacraments. Okay? Okay, on that, I'll build a bit more. Uh, you will have noticed something about how God works with us. Although not a Thomist, because we're talking here of someone from the Franciscan tradition, St. Clair of Assisi used to describe God as a God of courtesy. He's the most courteous God. And the, the point there was that God, far from forcing us to do what is good, instead tries to coax our hearts into doing what is good. Dinadaan niya tayo sa pagsusuyo. 
courts our hearts. He coaxes our hearts. He, not, he does not force our hearts to do good. So how does he coax us? How does he influence us? With the means of grace, with the teachings, with yung, yung sacraments, with the commandments. He gives us everything we need in order to be saved. But he will not force us to be saved. Another thing, no? In, in, during the course of this lecture, we have spoken about the will of God, the order that is willed by God. We often forget that there are two kinds of the will of God. You have the absolute will of God. I'm sorry. You have the absolute power of God, and you have the ordinate power, which is what he is, perf he is absolutely capable of doing anything. So, for example, if God wants you to not do you, he wants you to not commit sin he can he has all the power in the world to stop you from doing that but at the same time he already or he already ordained you know? he already willed that the world would proceed according to certain laws and that human society you know humanity would as a general rule proceed according to certain principles May mga laws na siyang sinet. So, hindi yan yung tipo na if Congress passes bad laws, biglang babagsak yung ceiling on them. Now, if, if Congress passes bad laws, most of the time, nothing will happen to them, at least not immediately. No? Kasi, he already willed that the world would exist in such a way that human beings would be able to exercise their free will and both suffer from the consequences and enjoy rewards from the consequences. So even there, no, yung ayo, yung John Paul II had this beautiful passage in Crossing the Threshold of Hope about how God, by giving us free will, para bang naging hostage pa siya sa atin eh, di ba? Parang instead of being able to force us to do what He wants, He is actually, He voluntarily, as it were, wills, as it were, to put Himself at our mercy. No, para bang siya pa yung dumarating na parang nagmamakaawa na, na to do what is good for us. To do, to do what is good for us so that we will be saved and that we will live with Him forever in heaven. Kaya nga, when we die and when we face our judgment, there really will not be any excuse. There will be no excuse. If we have rejected love in this life, there will be no there will be no second chance. We have been given all the chances in this world to be saved or to be damned. Okay. So, next question. Um, this sounds uh, connected, uh, probably. Hmm. Why will the loving God allow the sinners to endure the eternal fires of hell? Because, okay, so. In the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas, he takes up that question. And <clears throat> he says, if this is... If this is God, If this is the person, no? If this is God, this is the person. And this is the good he wants to get, which is a gravely sinful thing. There are two aspects to consider here. One is his movement towards this, which we can call his conversion to it. But while moving towards this, he moves away from God. That is aversion. So, in moving towards this, you move away from God. 
And if it is a very grave, sinful thing, you really have exchanged God for the thing. And that is what you suffer in hell. The pain of loss. There, there are actually a lot of uh, facets. Of First and foremost, diba, we are created with souls. And not just any kinds of souls. We have immortal souls. We have immortal souls. So precisely because our souls are immortal, kailangan, pag namatay na tayo, pag natapos ang ating earthly lives, meron tayong kalalagyan. But then, man was created, man was created by God with, the, with a view to his salvation that he will dwell in heaven. God did not create a second place where men will go. So if men cannot enter heaven, they will have to go to the only other place which was created not for men but for the evil angels. That's the only place they can go to. Okay, that's one of the classic answers of theology. Like I said, it's an extremely complex topic. Another thing is yung, yung, ano, yung why the infinite punishment? Because you offended God and God's majesty, God's holiness, God's dignity is infinite. So you have offered offense to infinite, to something infinite. And the reprisal for that, the punishment for that is also infinite. Okay. So that is the stark reality of hell. You know, hell is one of the most difficult, one of the most difficult topics in theology. But it's one of those things that no matter how much you want to explain it away, no matter how much you want to turn it into something metaphorical or into something symbolic, wala tayong magagawa. Nasa Biblia eh. Nasa New Testament, nasa Gospels, merong impyerno. Diba? So tayo, tayong mga Kristiyano, we can never say, kasi I believe in a loving God, therefore I don't believe in hell. We can't say that. The very same God who loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for us is the same God who has made it clear that if we reject him, we will go to hell. It's the same God. How can we say that we know more than God about love? So we cannot, we cannot simply reject, we cannot simply explain away the reality of hell. It is there. What we must do is not to explain away hell. What we must do is to avoid going to hell. That's what we must do. Okay. From a 13-year-old, he asked this question, what are concrete evidences of God's existence? Concrete evidences of God's This is a 13-year-old. <laughs> Let's apply some pedagogical. <laughs> Walang relo kung walang relohero. Walang mundo kung walang gumawa ng mundo. Therefore, there is God. For a 13-year-old. Huh? Uh, explain, ano ba? Kasi the 13 years old ako, may ganyan-ganyan. <laughs> Kasi I, I, like I said, no, my father was an atheist. No? My father was an atheist. In my case... Personally, in my case, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this can be applied to everyone else. No? But personally, when I was also struggling with certain questions about the existence of God, because my father, cause an explanation niya sa akin, when I was all of eight years old, was that the reason he did not believe in God was because bad things happen in the world. Okay, that's what that's his, so his main ex explanation for why he rejected the existence of God was the classic problem of evil. Okay, the classic problem of evil. And as a 12 or 13 year old, my, uh, strangely enough, for me, the problem of evil, far from destroying my faith in God, actually helped build it up. Because it also proved to me one thing that God is not someone who babies us as to prevent us from experiencing evil. 
he is someone who has enough confidence in us that we will be capable of standing up to evil. Believe it or not, that those were the kinds of thoughts I had as a 13 or 14 year old boy wrestling with this question. No? So for me, parang, the, re the reason I believed, I came to believe in God was because despite all the evil in the world, despite all the evil, I could still see a thousand and one evidences of good in this world. Evidences of good that simply don't make any sense until, unless you believe that there is something greater than human nature that is capable of inspiring that good. Uh, what are those thousand and one things? You know, people na walang pera, pero na pinapakain nila ang mga may hirap using their resources. You know, the example of people like Mother Teresa, who, by the way, my father admired, you know, uh, despite his being an atheist. People like, people like John Paul II, na rin ridicule ng buong media, ng buong world media. Yeah, people forget just how much the international media hated John Paul II. You know, people forget that now. You know? But uh, I was reading Manila Bulletin and Today and Inquirer as a kid. They, 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 puro, puro banat against John Paul II in the opinion pages. And yet here was a man who, in front of all the hatred of the world, continued to preach good. Is that, con are these concrete proofs? Perhaps for some, no. Perhaps for some, yes. But it proved to me that within the confines of human flesh, it was possible for godly thoughts to continue to exist. For me, that was a very strong, that was already a very strong proof that there was something more than being human. Something more than, something more than, something more than what man is capable of. And perhaps that was God. So that's how I thought then. I think I should have qualified my answer by saying, depende sa IQ ng 13-year-old. <laughs> anyway, I should not have said relojero. I should have said, there is no watch without a watchmaker. So there can be no world without the maker of the world. And that can only be God. Now, going to that thing on evil, uh, much of the evil we see, except for exploding volcanoes and, you know, things, uh, natural disasters, no, is really caused by man. It is man who causes the evil. There is so much um, question on why are there so many poor people? Abraham Lincoln, I think, was the one who said, God must have loved the poor so much that he made so many of them. <laughs> no? Now, but the real reason there is that I think, I think the Lord wants more good men to help the poor. Because for as long as we view, let us say, uh, property acquisition, building up riches, building up wealth. For as long as we treat wealth as just a personal matter of personal acquisition, if we don't look at the social nature of wealth, we will end up greedy. See? Going to John Paul, why was so much of the media against John Paul? Simple. It's because the Illuminati was against John Paul. They have been against the church, and they do everything. They own mainstream media. So it's just one click. Go ahead. Fire. Keep firing. That's it. That's the same thing. You know why there is a, a big Muslim uh, immigration uh, yeah, problem right now going on in, 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 in Europe? Well... Are you not wondering how come these educated leaders of Germany and different uh, countries of, of Europe have been opening their doors, their borders to them? That was a clear manipulation also by the Illuminati. And who are the Illuminati? This is the group of the super billionaires who have been long wanting to control the wealth of the world. They are the people behind population control, 
Bill Gates is on record as saying that he wants to reduce the population of this planet from 7 billion to 5 billion. That's why he's counting on vaccines. Buffett, Warner, and all the others, there is one who even wanted to d diminish our population, erase 6.5 billion, so we will have only 500 million people on this planet. These are the people who control. That's why, and we cannot do anything but to pray. There's so much evil being done by some people, not all people, most people are good. As they say in Desiderata, love is as perennial as the grass. So much good in the human heart. But that's the bulk of humanity who are full of goodness in their heart. There is a, a click within that humanity that wants to control everything. They want to control the population. They are the same people behind the LGBT rights. Recently, a, a, a Hungarian parliamentarian, I forgot his name now, because have you heard of George Soros? You've heard of George Soros? Okay, George Soros is the hatchet man of the Illuminati. He was exposed recently in the Hungarian parliament because George Soros, by the way, is a Hungarian Jew. And he was exposed as the man who is behind abortion, LGBT rights, the immigrate, the uh, refugee crisis in, in, in Europe and so on. Why? What is the real reason they have in mind? The real reason is they want Christian countries flooded with Muslims because they want to kill the Christian culture of Europe. Their public enemy number one is a Catholic church and all Christian cultures. That's why they're putting in Muslims. Please see through that. See through that. That's the real reason. This don't appear in the papers because many of our periodistas, writers, are not even aware of that. This happens from behind the scenes. One of the biggest, perhaps the chief of the Illuminati, is the Rothschild family. Their fortunes have been calculated to be about 3.5 trillion which surpasses so many things. And in the words of Rothschild himself, when you control media, you control the world. So please, when you read the papers, see through. Do not accept things at face value. Think. See through. Those are the very things you have to bear in mind. That whole Illuminati is arrayed against the Catholic Church. But don't worry, we have our Lord's promise. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Not all of hell, and certainly not the Illuminati. Okay, next question. Last question will be on. L last question now? Para madami pa yan eh. Last, wala na to. <laughs> <laughs> last question will be on freedom. Since freedom uh -huh. is usually used by people in making excuses of what they do, saying that freedom is doing whatever they'd like to do, how do we combat freedom in the Christian perspective so that we can lead, again, our people who think the same way as the others are in terms of freedom? I'll tell you what. Well, that's a, 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 a how to use the, how to use properly freedom within the Christian context now. Okay, before we do that, let me point out that the word freedom itself is often misused. We talk about freedom to do this, freedom to do that, etc., and so on. But you see, what we forget is that the word freedom connotes two things. It means two things. One meaning of freedom is negative. The other meaning of freedom is positive. Now what's the negative meaning of freedom? It means absence of restraint. For instance, I am not free to swim if you tie my hands and you tie my feet. 
if I'm bound, I am not free to swim. Because there is a restraint. Now, you, for me to be free to swim, you have to remove the restraint. You have to untie me. No? So once I'm untied, then there is now, I enjoy now negative freedom, absence of restraint. Okay? Question, am I free now to jump into the pool and swim? Well, you, want, you can if you like, but the point is, do you know how to swim? <laughs> okay? Now, knowing how to swim implies that you need positive freedom. The skill of swimming or know-how to swim. If you don't have positive freedom, you cannot exercise negative freedom responsibly. So you see? So, one is related to the other. The positive is related. Pr uh, positive freedom means the presence of a skill. All right? So if you translate that now to the Christian context, the only way you can use freedom intelligently in a Christian way is to inculcate in the child the habit of doing good, the habit of being responsible, the habit of respecting elder, elders, respecting God's laws, and so on. That way, he has now the virtues of the good life. Once he has that, then he is now free to do, to do what his positive virtues have enabled him to do. And he will realize as he goes on that after all, it is far better to use freedom responsibly than to use it irresponsibly. Otherwise, baka tukhang ang kalabasan niya. Uh, he, uh, that question, by the way, illustrates one of the fundamental philosophical problems that is faced by any thinking Christian today. It's the fact that usually the world, the secular world, uses a lot of terms that are Christian or at least Judeo-Christian or Greco-Roman Christian in origin. Terms of such as freedom, liberty, rights, equality, virtue, now, all these terms, hundreds and hundreds of terms. They, the secular world, continues to use these terms. But the meaning that they give to these terms is very different from the original. So the Christian meaning of freedom is very different from the way the secular world defines freedom. The same thing with equality. The same thing with identity. Uh, the same thing with so many others. So when it comes to, to discussing things, the dialoguing with non-believers or atheists or f secular philosophers, the very first challenge is to make sure that you're actually using the terms in the same way. Because you could be using the terms in very different ways, kaya hindi kay nagkakaitindihan. Or more dangerously, what sometimes happens is Christians unwittingly and almost imperceptibly begin using the same terms the way the secular philosophers or the secular thinkers are using these terms. Okay, I'll give you an example, something close to my heart, so pro-life. The reason why for so long the pro-life movement has resisted using the term gender is because it has a very different term from from no, from it 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 has a, it now has a very different uh, meaning. That day when you say sex or gender, pareho lang yon. But nowadays the term gender has a very specific meaning. It means your sexual self-identification divorced from your biological reality. Walang kinalaman sa, sa talagang biological makeup mo. So kahit na physically lalaki ka, if you identify in your mind as a woman, then gender ideology says, babae ka. 
but a lot of Christians today, they don't understand the difference, the way the word gender is used. So a lot of Christians, they use the term gender indiscriminately. And why is that bad? Because when they use this, these terms according to the, you know, when you use terms and you accept how they are used by the secular world, then they have won. Yung conceptual world mo bilang Kristiyano, napasukan na nila. Okay. And what happens slowly, surely, that begins forming how you think. Kasi the way we use words, the way we use terms, forms the way we make, we have ideas in our mind. Kaya nga yung language, napaka-importante niyan. Safeguarding yung integrity ng language. That's why very traditional pro-lifers don't even use the word, don't even use the term gay. It's always homosexual. Okay, not gay. Kasi yung gay has become co-opted to mean yung gender ng mga LGBT as understood in the secular world. Homosexual, on the other hand, nandun pa rin yung man to man, woman to woman. So, nandun pa, rin yung, nandun pa rin yung shade of it's not acceptable. Which is why in the Western world, you have some LGBT advocates who now want to use, who now want to stop the use of the term homosexual. They want to force everybody to use the term LGBT or gay. Kasi that's a way of conquering yung conceptual universe ng mga na tao naniniwala pa rin sa, ano, yung mga tao naniniwala pa rin sa traditional sexual morality. Okay. So, this is a very, very vast topic. Again, <laughs> no, we're just providing introduction. Minsan, ang, ang mahirap sa, ano, mahirap sa, dito sa apologetic seminar, we have so little time, and there's such a vast world of topics to be taken. So really, the most that we can do is give summaries, very small, very brief summaries of, of topics and of issues. But I hope you have learned from today. Before we end, I guess uh, I, I remember many times that when students ask me about freedom, I always stress to them that freedom is not an individual possession. It's a shared possession. So when you do things and you're now stepping on the freedom of others, Always remember that your freedom ends when the freedom of others begin. That's how simple it is to, to your, let them realize. Your freedom ends where the nose of another begins. <laughs> so that's all for our question and answer. Wow, we had a great day. That concludes our 11 weeks, no? 13 or 12. 12 weeks, 12 course sessions. No? Uh, so we'll see you next week. If you not yet sign up, sign up. Na. So we'll have the biggest grand Christmas party. Wear orange. I cannot say enough. Wear color orange. And the orange is not nothing fruit. Okay, let's all stand. Orange is a Buddhist color. <laughs> Let us now pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, we praise and bless your mighty name for having created us with your image and likeness. And you have given us the gift of intellect and will. Though men we are, we have fallen from our sins. But you continue to show your love for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And with the help, or by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we are continuously strengthened.